morning to some of you on the uh, West Coast and good afternoon to everybody else. And if we've got people who are joining in from other time zones, uh, wherever you happen to be, uh, happy Friday to you. Uh, my name is Mike Grain, and I'm going to be the moderator for this particular session. Uh, just as background, I've been in the industry for about 40 years, uh, both with the CPG uh, company like Procter & Gamble, I've worked for Walmart, and I have my own consulting company now uh called collaboration lc that was no no surprise focusing on on shelf availability um this is going to be hosted and you know as i shared last uh, time you know part of your uh things when you hit the kind of that end of your career you start thinking about is how to give back to the industry so uh, i'm volunteering my time to give back to the industry in the sp spirit of on shelf availability because i think it's an important topic in today's retail world uh, it's it's being uh, hosted by a couple of different uh, uh, groups. One is Conversations on Retail, which is led by Matt Pfeiffer. Uh, it's a great uh, it's a great platform to be able to hear from industry experts and hear real content of what's really going on in the world. So if you're interested, please uh, connect with that. He's on LinkedIn as well, and he's actually moderating this call. And then, of course, the University of, of Arkansas, the Sam Walton College, we, we would certainly not uh, be able to do this without their help and uh, really the retail supply chain initiative that is coming out of the supply chain organization. So a couple logistical rules. Uh, first off, you know, th we want this to be a conversation and very interactive, although it's hard to do that with this many people on the call. So we would ask you to stay on mute unless you have a question or a comment. Uh, and that's primarily for the presenters who are, are going to be here. Uh, for the presenters, we would ask that you keep your video on so we can see you. And we'll use the chat function primarily to get questions from the audience. Some of them send in questions ahead of time. Others uh, will certainly be using the chat function to answer any questions. And we do want this to be a very interactive session. And because we have, you know, four direct companies who are directly competing with each other, we're going to ask that everybody refrain from asking, to doing anything that uh, violates antitrust, anything that looks like pricing or discounts or timing of changes or any, you know, things that are not of public knowledge. We're really here to educate our retailer partners and our, and our FMCG and CPG's partners about the role that robotics plays in retail, specifically as it relates to on-shelf availability. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I, I do want to uh, go ahead and just set the backdrop for this is we showed this screen last time and I think it's really relevant that there's a multiple ways to measure on-shelf availability and some of these would work actually together. Uh, the one we talked about a few months ago was uh, algorithms. So algorithms that pull in data and then tell you or predict for you when you actually have an on-shelf availability problem. We have a bunch of companies out there that are doing typically crowdsourced store audits like Field Agent and, and Trax and GigWalk and some of those folks. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about today is the role that the shelf scanning robot plays in on-shelf availability measurement and out-of-stock detection, et cetera. And then last but not least, specifically for apparel and general merchandise kind of merchandise, RFID is playing a very, very important role with some retailers. So we are we are very, very uh, fortunate to have a number of different experts on the line. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and start this off by literally having them uh, unmute themselves, introduce. We'll just do it in alphabetic order just to keep it as fair as we can. Uh, we'll start out with uh, David. We're, we're going to start out with you with Brain Corporation. You want to give us a little, get, introduce yourself and Brain Corporation and uh, kind of the things that you would like to uh, share about Brain. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, hosting us and for inviting us to this conference. Very excited to talk with uh, this extinct, the distinguished group of people about uh, this important topic. Um, so my name is David Pinn. I'm currently the CFO of BrainCorp. Going to be stepping into the CEO role here in a couple of months. Um, just give you a quick intro about BrainCorp. Uh, we're a San Diego-based company, team of innovators, really focused on building intelligent tools um, for robotics. I think one of the things that uh, you know really differentiates our company. Uh, is the scope and the scale at which we operate. Uh, we have uh, over 20,000 robots deployed across the globe, um, pretty well focused in um, high uh, labor rate countries, as you would imagine. So North America, Western Europe, uh, Japan, um, and uh, other countries in Asia as well. Um, you can see some of the logos where we've deployed till today. 
Um, and our focus to start really was on floor care robotics. Um, and from there, you know, we really migrated up back into other areas as well, with which I'll talk about. Uh, if you just want to flip one slide over. Um, you know, one of the things that is uh, unique about our business model is that we work in concert with manual equipment manufacturers. Uh, and so BrainCorp is uh, a company that provides uh, AI solutions to manufacturers. Uh, we don't make robots. We make technology to help others make robots. Um, and you can see here um, a pretty broad portfolio of floor cleaning equipment. Uh, the one that I'll call your attention to is on the upper left, uh, which is a machine that's got, there you go, uh, which is a machine that's got a scanning tower on it. So this is a machine that can both um, scrub the floor as well as scan the shelves. Um, and that'll be the topic that we talk about today. So big focus on retail, but of course our deployments are also in airports, hotels, uh, hospitals, malls, universities, et cetera. So again, delighted to be here and uh, thank you for including us. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and, and we actually have a, a small video here of, of uh, actually a robot, which is the shelf scanning robot. Looks like it's in use at uh, Sam's Club. Is that where that is? Exactly right. Okay. Very good. BJ or Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Santiago. I shouldn't call you BJ. William Santiago. Uh, <laughs> you, want, you want to take it over from here? You're from Badger Technologies. Yeah. Hi, guys. I'm BJ Santiago uh, with Badger Technologies, uh, the CEO. Um, know many of the guys in the panel. Uh, Luis is the uh, first time we're meeting, but know the other gentlemen. Um, great to meet you. Uh, Badger, as you may or may not know, is a global automation solutions company uh, where we combined advanced analytics and machine learning to convert the retailer's data into metrics that they can um, uh, make decisions on and improve their working conditions. Uh, you know, we, we are... Uh, in what we do today with uh, evaluating shelf conditions and uh, hazard mitigation, which is another application we've got, we've got over 600 robots deployed worldwide. Uh, we are currently in uh, now 16 brands worldwide, um, eight of which are in production, another eight are uh, under pilot. Um, we have robots deployed around the world. Uh, we have um, uh, Customers such as the uh, Woolworths Group, which is in Australia and New Zealand. We have uh, uh, Ahold, two brands of them, and Stop a Shop, and, and Giant Company in the Northeast. We have uh, Woodman's, which is a large uh, Midwestern brand, uh, superstores. Uh, and then we have a few customers, uh, new customers that are in the DIY and hardware um, uh, industry. Uh, surprisingly enough, that's becoming a big adoption for us. Um, and then we have... Uh, some of our other robots are deployed in, in uh, different countries, such as Portugal, um, throughout the European Union and across domestically across the U.S. Uh, we offer um, beyond just the on-shelf availability with our robots. We also have different applications that Badger brings to the market. Uh, we have a uh, inform robot that is very modular. It, uh, one brand name is called Insight. And that's the inventory control robot that we'll probably talk most about today. But that same robot can also do a, an inspect application where it evaluates the floor conditions of a, of a retailer store, um, alerting on slip and fall debris and, and just you know, being a good hazard mitigation um, tool. Uh, and then we also have the ability to uh, one of our newest functions, and we do have a one, our first production customer, which is the uh, National Veterans Museum and Memorial in Columbus, Ohio. But we, have a, we offer a security bot where the robot does... Uh, um, basically third shift augmentation, checking for windows, doors, defibrillators, um, uh, fire extinguishers, things of that nature where they don't want to use a, a full-time employee to do those simple tasks. Um, and then we also have a UV bot and uh, soon coming, uh, the November timeframe, it's right now it's in beta with some testing and research and development is an RFID robot as well. So we have uh, one robot that can do three modular um, applications, and we also have uh, um, <clears throat> a separate robot for the UV and the RFID. Uh, our robots to date have uh, transversed within stores over 1.3 uh, million miles. Um, so uh, very proud of, of that na navigation capability without an incident, um, which is great. Um, and really super excited to be here with my colleagues. Uh, I think that, you know, we're four great guys, you know, going after the same thing and, and servicing the customers the right way. So uh, 
you know, just I'll learn today as well. But uh, Mike, thanks for having me. And um, uh, Badger, super excited to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, BJ, very much. Um, I think the next one is Brad uh, from Simbi. You want to go ahead and uh, go ahead and unmute and introduce yourself and the company? Absolutely, Mike. Uh, and thank you again so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, look forward to our discussion today. You know, at Simbi, we're a full stack provider of computer vision and RFID based uh, shelf, shelf scanning solutions in the market. Our core flagship product is called Tally. Uh, it was actually one of the first uh, production solutions in the market to, to be available. And we've had the fortunate opportunity to do large scale work with more than a dozen retailers across more than four countries. Uh, so today as part of our discussion, given we all have limited time together, we'll get deeper into you know, how these capabilities unlock value and uh, what these solutions look like at scale. Uh, but look forward to the discussion. And I believe Mike has a brief video here um, just to highlight our capabilities and solution in action. Everybody thinks, well, it's real simple. You know how much product you ship to the store. You know what went out the front end. Why do you get out of stocks? Well, it, it assumes a perfect world. There's a lot of different variables, and that's where Tally comes in. Tally increases our in-stock position. It will make sure that our tags are accurate, our prices are accurate. It'll make sure that the products are laid out in the right space, and with the robot determines there's an out-of-stock. Within 15 minutes, one of our teammates gets a message on their handheld saying, go determine if this product's out of stock and we need to place an order. When you think about the benefits that we will have to our entire customer base, it's a great value proposition. Tally knows how to interact with people in the aisles. It avoids them. If an aisle's too busy, it'll skip it and come back. So it's not a disruptor to our stores. It's actually a major enabler. Great. Brad, anything else you want to add? No. Let's get into the discussion. Okay. We got one more. Lewis, you're up. Hey, Zippity. Besides being a really, really cool name, it's just fun to say. Tell us a little bit about Zippity. Okay, so hi. So first of all, thanks uh, for having having us on. Uh, it's 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 great to be with my get to meet all my colleagues for the first time. Um, we're we're probably the the latest comer to the party, uh, but we had tried to do this in an earlier company before. Uh, so basically, our vision is is that retail, like when you look at the internet, uh, the first companies that were able to get on the internet were were the ones that had structured data like banks and so forth and uh we believe that that and our focus is to digitize the stores so that so we can turn unstructured data of the store into structured data once you have that structured data then uh you are able to do a whole bunch of applications that will 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 solve real business problems and uh, so we've focused on, first of all, getting the accuracy. We focused very heavily. If that, if that, what we call the digital twin is not accurate, then you're pretty much dead. Uh, so we, our first, first uh, order of, of, uh, of focus is accuracy. So we've got the accuracy down. We're up, up over 90, 95% in, 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 the, in the metrics that we provide. And, uh, and then with, once you have that, that information, now you can start doing applications. So uh, some of those applications are out of stock, uh, price check, uh, but we're, we are venturing into other things. We're working with uh, last mile delivery. And then there's, uh, there's even, uh, we're doing some stuff with virtual, uh, online virtual shopping uh, that this digital twin will be useful. So uh, we, we actually started in Latin America, which is uh, kind of what, um, what Brain was saying that the focus was high labor. We actually started in the low labor, so we we focused also on on getting a very economic uh, solution. And uh, and today we're we ventured into North America, and we have uh, uh, says like about almost 300 stores deployed uh, and deploying very quickly. So this is a thing that's uh, it's it's it is a thing, uh, and uh, we're very excited to be part of it. So. Anyway, and I think and I think all of us can really help move the market on this because not not everybody understands it that way. So anyway, uh, thanks for having us, and I'm really eager to get and move forward to the conversation. 
Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for being part of this on a busy Friday and probably been a busy week for everybody. Uh, we have about 43 people on the line right now. I did have a couple of retailers ask me if we could reschedule this this morning, some pretty important retailers, and I told them that would be really hard to do. But we are going to be making this available uh, through Conversations on Retail and with the University of Arkansas online. We've got these guys' permission to record this session, so all the questions and all the videos that you've seen will be available for you. So if you've got other people who wanted to attend but couldn't attend for some reason, uh, just let me know and I can, I can get that to them. Uh, secondly is I've got a series of questions. We're going to go kind of go one by one. But we do want to make this a conversation. Uh, so if you do have a question, use the chat function to send it to me. And once we get through these couple of questions that I've got for these guys, uh, I'll open it up for, for the chat questions to come through. Okay. So the first one we're going to we're gonna, uh, ask uh, Badger to, to answer, which is, okay, I see a lot of robots. I see a lot of robots in stores. I, what exactly are the business drivers for shelf scanning robots in retail? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, there's a ton of business drivers, and, and the panel will probably share just different variations of them. But from a very holistic macro perspective, you know, ultimately, these robots are trying to improve the on-shelf availability of products. So the, the number one business driver is to improve their sales. Uh, most of the retailers we look at want to see a, a, a unit improvement of about 2%. Um, but it's evaluating those shelf conditions to make sure that the product's there for the, uh, for the customer to buy. Uh, another thing, business drivers, giving them faster and more real-time um, metrics and views into the conditions of the shelves. And why I say that is just a simple fact of you mentioned IRI and some of the other data aggregator companies out there that do great things, but most of their reports are at the end of the day um, and they're algorithmic and from the point of sale. Uh, all of our companies allow us to uh, you know, get, give that uh, customer several, several views within the store throughout the day. Um, and which they can make actions on and, and do replenishments and so forth like that. Uh, another business driver is enhanced analytics, you know, trending data, um, and also operationalizing the data. I don't know if we'll talk about that today, but the, 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 the insurance that you can operationalize this data, and that's a collaborative effort between our companies and the customers and working together because they we can we can give them as much data as they need, right? But the fact of the matter is you have to match that up with operationally how is their change management able to use that data. So that's a big business driver. You'll see a lot of times they'll say, well, we can't operationalize that right now. Um, from a very, very high level, you know, some of the business drivers are identifying out of stock, looking at the price, um, the planogram compliance, uh, checking for price integrity issues, whether the regular price or wrong price. Um, Product detection, understanding if that's the right product or the wrong product, right? So there's spread in the industry where our Sprite boxes are over the Coke labels, right? Uh, an associate will walk by that for an inventory control and think it's a beautiful looking shelf and won't, won't scan it or identify it as being out of stock. And, and our technologies uh, are used to identify the wrong products. Um, and product location. Uh, you know, today we have a customer that uses our product locator to actually update their consumer mobile app. And so, you know, we can identify where things are on the shelf from an XY coordinate, feed that information to the retailer and, uh, and help them out in that way. So if you look at it, it's very simple. The business drivers are improve, improve customer experience, improve sales, uh, you know, repurpose labor. You know, we all know there's a labor shortage out there. Um, there's other things around supplier collaboration that I'll let the guys talk about. Uh, working capital, right? Having, you know, less safety stock in the back of the stores. So ultimately it's improving that customer experience. It's probably the number one driver while the organizations are using us. So Awesome. So uh, Brad from Simbi, how does this thing actually work? I mean, we saw your video with that actually navigating through a store and going around people. What exactly is it collecting? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. If we if we kind of take a step back, I, I think there's an important question to answer on like, what does it take to, to make these solutions work? in the environment and the, the reality and the beauty of this type of shelf scanning technology is it doesn't require any infrastructure changes to these stores right uh, by purely leveraging the retailers wi-fi connectivity a small parking spot uh, with on the store floor and and uh, a power outlet these solutions can get up and running rapidly so the way they work is when you initially unbox them 
they're essentially using their sensor suite to build a high quality sort of digital twin of the store from a map perspective. Um, and once you have that map, uh, the solution can understand where, you know, really all the shelving fixtures are um, in areas of interest that you want to scan. Um, and once those have been defined, it's really about architecting missions uh, that make most sense for the retailer and their business processes. Uh, so today we see these solutions, you know, operating traditionally during normal store hours, you know, sometimes overnight. Uh, but often, you know, blending seamlessly in with customer traffic um, and employee engagement in the environment. And then as, as it's going up and down the store aisles, it's capturing things like high quality 2D and 3D data to make precise out of stock detections, you know, do facings analysis, really extract the price and promotional tags throughout the environment. Um, we're often seeing that about 30 to 50% of out of stocks are controllable across the grocery space today. So huge opportunity, um, to get product back on the shelf. Uh, it's not unusual for us to step into a store and see three to 5% of price tags being incorrect for the first time. Um, and, uh, as was just shared, you know, these solutions are capturing up-to-date product information as they go. Uh, so in this highly dynamic supply chain environment that we're in, Product could be in a core aisle. It could be on a promotional display. Um, how do you keep an up-to-date understanding of, of where that product is? Uh, so those are a number of the capabilities on, you know, sort of the computer vision side. On the RFID front, it's very similar. Uh, so by using RFID antennas, you essentially have a mobile RFID reading platform that can take precise inventory counts um, and, and cycle counts across these environments as well as be able to triangulate specifically where that tag is in the store, uh, which is deeply valuable for those high value goods retailers or apparel retailers. Um, when you know, folks can order online and pick up in store, they're doing shipment out of store. Um, uh, but all of these insights are then essentially made available through a lot of the retailers' traditional business uh, tools. So it's their workforce management system, their supply chain or computer assisted ordering system, um, as well as the consumer mobile app uh, and other third party um, uh, systems. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, Lewis uh, from Zippity, we've got a, a two part question because I'm trying to combine the questions I gave you as well as some ones that are coming in. By the way, we already have like six questions out there, so it's we're going to be moving to open questions pretty quickly. Uh, so adoption is expanding. Why? And a build on that is well, what exactly wh wh where exactly is Zippity in the U.S.? Uh, do they have any U.S. locations yet or what's your plans in the U.S.? Yeah, so so answering the first question is um, so I think this again the especially the the whole um, pandemic thing has put a lot of stress on these on these companies and then you have the whole digital the, the digitization movement that we we talked about um, so you know we believe that there's going to be one of these robots in every single store in the future at some point. Uh, so I think it's just a trend that's that's going to is going to be happening. It's going to get stronger, and as as retailers start to um, appreciate the the value that it, it this brings to str help streamline their operations and bring down costs and, and efficiency, because we've been able to show that uh, efficiency can the the efficiency can increase by thirty to fifty in some cases fifty percent. So where you where you had one person doing one thing, you 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 actually so two people doing one thing now you have one person doing a thing. So that's another with this whole thing that's going on right now with the labor is again it's another huge uh, mm -hmm. huge thing. So I just think it's uh, it's something retailers need to do. They need to go from unstructured data to structured data so that they can apply compute power. To their to managing their stores up until they today it's pretty much manual, in in essence. Um, okay. So uh, and your second your the second question second question was, was what retailer Zippity is working with in the U.S. Yeah, so we have a lot of like uh, non disclose we're not allowed to disclose publicly yep. uh, some of the the big ones we have, uh, but we are we right now we're f of the three hundred almost three hundred robots that I mentioned. Uh, it's about 50-50 U.S. and uh, and Latin America. 
Okay. Uh, but Latin, but the U.S. is growing very, very quickly. We we expect this year we have a good possibility of uh, overcoming something like 700 robots this year. Um, okay. So it's growing very, very quickly, and it's uh, it's uh, it's huge. And then uh, and on 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 that note, um, it's uh, again we're, we we believe that retailers will see the value and and start imp- implementing this because it's something they they have to do. Excellent. Thank you very much. David, last but not least, Brain Corporations. Um, you already mentioned that your your robots perform a number of functions. Obviously, floor cleaning is one of them. Uh, obviously, things like shelf scanning robots, which is what, what we're doing here. That's one of the value propositions where these robots can pr- provide multiple functions to the retailer. The, the question for you is kind of what kind of alerting just in the shelf scanning robot part of this business does a retailer actually get with the solution that you provided? Absolutely. And I, just to dovetail on what Brad was saying, uh, you know, the output of these robots go to a number of different environments, right? So the output can go to an inventory management solution. The output can go to a customer facing shopping app. The output can go to a store employee to help them, uh, you know, reconfigure the shelf. Um, and so those alerts can go to a number of different areas. I would say, you know, there's three large categories of alerts uh, when we think about, you know, in-store execution, you know, there's stock level type alerts, you know, low stock, out of stock. Uh, there's price tag exception alerts. So the price tag is incorrect. The promotional uh, price is set wrong. Um, you've got planogram compliance type alerts. So the product is in the wrong location. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll plug uh, a hole in the store so it doesn't look like they're out of stock, but the wrong thing's in the wrong place. Um, so, you know, those kind of alerts are really important or, or the wrong number of facings. Um, so those kind of alerts, I think, are really uh, critical to help the store execute um, using using this technology. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, we're going to open it up to the panelists. So you, any of you guys can jump in on this particular question. And I'm not going to go on my prepared questions because we've got a lot of questions coming in from the audience. Uh, BJ, this one was specifically for you. What do, When does the Badger robot operate? It'll, it'll vary per retailer. Um, and per application. So uh, typically uh, from an inventory perspective, the the Badger robots for most of our customers will uh, run very early mornings, depending on their their geography location, the 5.30, 6.30 type of uh, timeframe. Um, What that enables it to do is to get a pristine look at at the store conditions after they have um, uh, fixed the store from the night before. It uh, gives them the ability to uh, get corrections done uh, mid mid morning before the afternoon rushes. So, from an inventory perspective, most of our customers are doing um, early morning scans. Now, that being said, uh, we also run scans throughout the day for all of our customers, and typically addressing their fast moving or DSDI type of items. Right, anything that's fast moving in the store that they may not have uh, direct um, shelf edge cameras on there, uh, you know, in their stores, but they need to see it more often, right? So if they're not using fixed cameras where they have to look at something more frequently, um, then uh, we're doing a lot more runs. And then we typically do a uh, an evening run too, and that will vary anywhere from 6.30 to 9.30 in stores. And then we have some international stores that are open 24 hours. So uh, it's we run based on the store's operational needs, right? Based on their supply chain needs and the way they're addressing uh, their replenishment. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Anybody else want to add or build on that? Are we good? Yeah, I, I, I'd say, again, I concur uh, that that it depends on the retailer. Uh, we've seen that that the, the difference between when you're going with customers in, what it does is just makes the scan a lot more inefficient and slower. Uh, but eventually, you can do it with customers in it. Uh, but it's better to try to do it in the, when when traffic is low. That that's either either that or or replenishment activities that are going on. Uh, you're you're trying to look for those windows where where is. But you do not want to want to you know complicate the customers when they're buying because this robot is going by. Yeah. But they are fully autonomous and they do wait until the customer is out of the way. But still, it, 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 it's, it's preferable when there's less customers inside the store. Yeah, Mike, I'll, I'll add to that just real quick what Lewis said. I think we all, all of our companies will work with the retailers on holiday schedules, you know, high traffic times where we just may not run the robot. But that's, it again, in collaboration. We don't make those decisions. We make them together. Uh, and, and that's driven by the retailer. So, Perfect. Perfect. 
Um, this one is a sensitive one. I bet we got to be really, really careful with this one. But I want to lay it out there because it's a question on people's mind. It's kind of a two-part question. The first one was from an attendee. It says, how does Brain charge their customers for scanning the shelf service? So that's a pretty specific question. And again, via antitrust, we're not going to get into specifics. But there was another question that was similar. What is the business model for each company to sell or rent the robot? And what's the price range? I'd like to ask you guys to kind of avoid the whole price range <laughs> unless you guys want to all agree on one big number so we don't all go to jail. <laughs> um, but, but basically, I think there's a question out here is, OK, this really looks cool. There's going to be an ROI, and, and maybe we'll start it out with you, David, because you're you're sort of the CFO moving into the CEO role. How do you how do retailers think about the value proposition versus the cost of this thing, and how do they end up uh, paying for the service? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and I think I speak for all of us that you know largely it's a SaaS type offering or a, a RAS type offering, as as we say in this industry. So, robot as a service or software as a service, where people are typically paying a a per store per month type of fee, I think is a very typical business model here. So we won't obviously get into pricing either. Uh, it ranges from zero to infinity. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, but in terms of uh, in, in terms of the payout uh, for the investment, you know, I think it was stated here before increased sales, I would say is, you know, by far uh, the biggest thing that retailers are looking for here. Um, so it's, you know, it, a 1% increase in on-shelf availability equals a 1% increase in revenue, you know, that kind of formula, I think is, um, you know, really driving a lot of this adoption. Uh, there's, of course, also just efficiencies in terms of, you know, having the workers in the store, the associates being more effective at their job. Uh, and that can be a big uh, ROI driver as well. Um, and then the third one, which, you know, kind of combines these are, are increased customer loyalty, right? So you have a better customer experience where people being able to find uh, what they're looking for when they go in the store, uh, you know, that's going to improve repeat shoppers. Uh, and so, you know, really it's that, that kind of three-part value prop on, on the payback side. Um, on the cost side, of course, you know, we're all um, working to bring down the cost of these solutions. You know, I think on our end, uh, you know, the BrainCorp magic really is about partnering with third-party um, existing equipment manufacturers. So we're leveraging scale of existing in, in industries. We're leveraging existing service sales and support networks. Uh, and so for us, you know, that is a lever. Um, that we're able to pull in order to bring costs down um, and really give retailers comfort uh, in choosing a robotic solution from, you know, potentially a vendor that they've been using in the past for, for other types of equipment. So uh, we're very focused on, you know, those kind of ecosystem synergies to bring down uh, the total cost of ownership and really amplify that ROI. Yep. Perfect. Yep. And I and I would add to that that um, it's, it's these 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 you have to you have to be able to manage these machines, if you will, on a on a broad scale, and that's something that the the retailer is not going to be either equipped or want to do. So so that's why the RAS model or the robot as a service model is the the most adequate in this in this case. Yeah, Mike, I'll add also that you know there, there's. I'll, we'll see different variations per geos too. I, I noticed RAS and, and, and robot as a service is more popular from our perspective, from the Badger view uh, in Europe, where the U.S. is still mixed with a CapEx approach and, or, and, or, and a robot as a service. So um, again, it just varies on how the uh, retailer is doing their, their economics, right? And how they want to acquire it. But I think all of us offer flexibility in, in addressing the ways that they want to buy the products. Absolutely. Perfect. So, so this is a this is a question that I actually got before the conference started. So you probably won't see it on the live chat. But uh, what percentage of grocery stores in any market need to be covered with robots for the solution to be considered mainstream? And there's an add-on today. It still feels like a niche, although each one of you talked about a lot of robots being deployed. Uh, you still don't see them in major, you know, retailers. So where do you think this is going to go? Is this is this a niche thing or is this something that's really going to have the scale uh, to really drive the industry in terms of a new way of collecting this data and acting on it? So, so like, as I said before, we <laughs> honestly and firmly believe that there will be one robot in every retail store. Hmm. It, it, it enables you to pr apply compute power to manage your store. That is not possible today. And so... The answer is all of them. Go ahead, Brad. 
So. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, we believe strongly, uh, similar to what was just stated, this technology will become ubiquitous. I think it's actually operating at a far greater scale today than folks realize just because, you know, the, the press release and sort of public persona to sort of this technology has maybe not been disseminated in, in sort of a number of cases. Um, the reality is beginning to see this data in a single store is incredibly eye-opening for a particular retailer. We all have to keep in mind that these stores have never been captured at this frequency and fidelity that this technology provides. And day one, going into a store that you may have a store manager that's been there 40 years, you will know more um, about the sort of true state of the shelf uh, than, than they will. And so that's why it, it is super empowering, uh, even starting at sort of a smaller scale. We often see many retailers today starting with sort of the 10 to 25 level uh, unit wise to get a, a good sample across uh, their geographical mix, store execution mix, uh, store revenue mix, uh, stores that may have different assortments. And it really helps to paint sort of a complete picture of you know, what their environment looks like. Now, of course, to maximize the amount of benefits you can get, um, it's, it's really about sort of going chain wide, uh, but we're seeing retailers today employ um, not only this data for themselves, but with a 10 to 25% sample of their stores, being able to monetize that data downstream um, with brands and other third party stakeholders within the environment. So what's clear is this solution is not only um, an operational and sort of data solve for the retailer, but it can actually become a profit center. Hmm. And more. Mike, uh, how, uh, how does it how does it become a profit center? Yeah, ab absolutely. So when we think about the stakeholders, this data is valuable to. Much of the discussion here has been you know retailer centric. As we know, this solution incredibly benefits the the consumer or shopper themselves by improving mm -hmm. store execution. But there are so many folks in the retail value chain that operate in these stores. You know, we have brands, both warehouse brands and DSD mm -hmm. brands. Um, so this data can be valuable for DSD players to understand, or are they executing properly at a store level? We have DSD vendors today that are changing their routing mechanisms from schedule-based to demand-based based upon what they actually see. Um, warehouse uh, brands, for the first time in their history, they can really understand did our product not sell today because nobody bought it? Mm. Or did it sell, not sell today because it wasn't actually on the shelf? And that was a question you were never able to answer before until you have this level of instrumentation. And when you think about the other players, this data is valuable to its folks like e-commerce players, the Instacarts of the DoorDashes of the world, um, to optimize both the online experience of what products are available now, as well as to optimize you know, picking and path planning and which stores they go to. Um, and lastly, as well as the market insight companies, right? If you combine this with the incredible data sets that the Nielsen's and IRIs of the world have, you can answer questions that have never been answered before. Awesome. And maybe just to, just to amplify, you know, what Brad was saying about the, the uh, apparent adoption versus the actual adoption, you know, there's a lot going on, you know, kind of under the tip of the iceberg that's not in press releases in this area. You know, I mentioned, you know, in my introduction, we've got 20,000 robots deployed. Um, you know, we've announced uh, a full deployment at Sam's Club, which is 600 stores. I know these guys have made a few announcements as well, uh, but there's a lot more going on that's not announced. And so I think the level of activity in the space is understated um, mm -hmm. versus the reality. Yeah, we're, we're starting to see now, uh, you know, and, and it's great to have competition with our colleagues here, but, you know, our robots can be in the same brand at the same time at different locations, right? They're, they're just testing the abilities each company might specialize in or have different nuances in. So that's, you know, that's becoming more frequent. Um, also, I'd like to add, and I don't know if my colleagues are experiencing this, it's a very complex sale, uh, unlike, um, you know, software technologies and other things like that. When you're mixing the analytic platform uh, along with robotics, um, you're dealing with a lot of people that can say no versus yes. You know, you're dealing with the merchandising, the IT, the finance, the supply chain. Uh, a lot of us start in the innovation group. You know, so there's a lot of people evaluating and learning the technology. We're teaching them at the same time um, on a lot of this technology. So uh, there's a lot of people involved in, in 
rolling this out and getting, uh, as David just said, you know, official press releases out. Um, but I think we're all doing a great job of uh, diligently working with with many brands out there. And so um, I think just the, the buying cycles are a little bit slower than all of us would like to see. Yeah, the, the buying cycles are slow and then it's it's still kind of niche, as you mentioned. Uh, but as as it becomes more valuable and people start to perceive, it should become a movement is what we believe. Yeah. So, so quick question to, well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask these questions differently. We're, we're getting a lot of questions around alternatives in that first slide that I laid out. I showed that algorithms can be used if you have high velocity items to show things are out of stocks. We've got things like um, store audits. We have third parties like a field agent or gig walker tracks going and take pictures. They can do some of the things you're doing. Another one that was added, which is a great one to catch, which is, hey, we've got people who are putting fixed cameras in. What's the value proposition of a fixed camera, et cetera? So I think these are all very, very fair. Um, help us understand why a retailer would choose a shell scanning robot versus some of these other alternatives. Yeah, so so just like a little bit of background, uh, I'm an, a serial entrepreneur. This is my third company trying to work on this problem. Uh, in the 90s, we were actually putting track cameras on the roofs of uh, supermarkets to do exactly the same thing. Uh, then in the 2000s, we were we actually started putting fixed cameras on the shelf. Uh, the, the, what we encountered there was that the problem is that you need to the, the fixed cameras are, are at well at the time they you also had to power them, but you don't need to power them. Now you can put batteries on them, et cetera. But the megapixel of a camera across the aisle does not give you, it could not give you enough information to be able to, for example, uh, draw out the, the planogram, for example, because you can't read the labels. Hmm. Uh, so, so what we found is, uh, and, and, and in my earlier company, is when it was actually a customer that gave us the idea to put in a robot, 2013. And at the time, the technology wasn't there. It only became available like 2016, 17, where it was actually possible to do this. Uh, when, it, when, when, at the, at which point we jumped back into this and built Zippity. Um, so fixed cameras are, and we've tried everything under the sun, humans with cameras, we've tried everything. And I, we, again, firmly believe that these robots are the only way to effectively capture them today and probably in the next five to 10 years. You, you can think that maybe in the future you'll have drones flying through the thing and whatever, but but today, with given the, 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 the amount of data you need to capture and with the fidelity you need to capture it, uh, robots are the way to go, without, without a doubt, after, after 30 years of working on this problem. Mike, and if I may add, uh, you know, we definitely see the autonomous robotic solution being the most scalable solution in these environments, right? We're all talking about stores here that range anywhere from, you know, five to 10,000 square feet to 300,000 square feet, right? And as you get into these large format FMCG environments, you know, the cost of fixed infrastructure just doesn't make sense. And as was just shared, uh, you actually do not extract the same level of information, you know, whether it's the barcode, whether it's accurate product recognition, whether it's price. On the algorithmic side, look, like this industry has had algorithmic based solutions for a long time, just looking at sales velocity data. Mm -hmm. uh, those solutions can work for some of the highest turn products. Uh, but what we have seen is solutions like ours put head to head against these solutions. You can you really begin to understand, um, you know, the differentiation. And what we found is there's such a small number of SKUs that the algorithmic based solutions worked optimally for, and it's it's still a predictive result. Whereas we actually have a definitive picture of what was happening on that shelf at that time. The algorithmic result still requires someone to sort of go look in and, and sort of verify. Um, so many retailers will operate algorithmic-based approaches in conjunction with these types of solutions. Uh, but what we have found is they're relevant to less than three or five percent of the SKU base. And traditionally, we still have information superiority even over those SKUs. Hmm. And we should add that, you know, the algorithmic approach, it works for out of stocks, but it doesn't, I mean, it can work for out of stocks in three to 5%, but 
doesn't work for low stock, doesn't work for planogram, doesn't work for price label. So yep. it's exactly. an extremely limited solution versus what we can do. Yep, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I think for all of us, uh, just if I can add this, Mike, uh, for all of us to be successful, I mean, this was our architecture approach coming out was to have somewhat of an open architecture understanding that this is, I think if, if we're all uh, honest with each other, it's, it's yeah, these retailers need a hybrid model, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we need to offer that IoT connectivity to work with the fixed camera organizations or work with other investments that they may have made where the robot can maybe be the main source of that information. You know, we, we have clients today where we're taking fixed camera photos and ingesting them as our robots are going through the store to build them in one holistic report. So I think that um, if I understand, you know, everybody's offering pretty well, uh, you know, we're all open to this more hybrid type of thing, understanding that uh, these retailers made big investments in some of this older technology and it just can't be ripped out. So um, yeah. I, I think the hybrid approach and open architecture is important moving forward. Yeah. And, and the other very important uh, thing is the speed of deployment. So putting in fixed cameras in a store, uh, is is a pretty gargantuan gargantuan ta task, and uh, these robots like today we're deploying like just last week we we deployed twelve robots in one week. Uh, it takes it once you've once you've uh, taught the algorithms to read what they need to read. Uh, it takes twenty four hours to to uh, to train the store, and then you're up and going immediately. So having enough teams in parallel. You, you basically can scale this very, very quickly, which you cannot do with other systems. Yeah, especially when you remodel a store and you completely break down gondolas and reorganize stuff. You'd have to exactly. go and change all the cameras around and changing the, the pattern of a robot would be a pretty quick and easy thing. That's a great. Exactly. Point. And then and then and then because the, the this robot can read the labels, if the, those changes do occur, then the robot just self learns. If yep. you had fixed cameras, you got to you got to <laughs> read program the 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 system to tell it this in this space this is what's supposed to be here which is yep. it's definitely not scalable so so i want to i want to ask you a question because i'm getting a couple of little questions that are touching this but you guys aren't implementing a robot in a store you're implementing a change management way of driving behavioral change in a store because if you just run the robot and you give somebody a thousand different alerts, somebody's got to eventually do something with that or nothing's going to change. Walk us through the difficulty about change management. Who are you talking to? Who owns that at the retailer? If you're going to share it with the direct store delivery uh, player that you mentioned in there, Brad, who, would the, who in the supplier community are you going to get involved with? I, this is a big project. I mean, this is not just implement a robot and let it run. There's a lot of things that have to change to actually take the changes in behavior to get the product fixed and the pricing fixed, et cetera. How do you navigate through that? Yeah, Mike, as you mentioned, there's so much shared value, not only across the retailer themselves, but all the other stakeholders operating in this environment. So what all the companies you know, on this call had to take is, is sort of an incremental approach and in sort of unlocking that value. Um, how do you not hit these retailers with sort of the data tsunami day one, but help them understand sort of the holistic value? Uh, so step one, we really see as um, really empowering the store teams, which are sort of the first line of defense with helping them understand the true state of their stores and what issues are actually can be controlled by them. Um, that data may throw, flow through sort of our own applications, you know, sort of initially. And as the retailer goes to scale, this integrates more deeply into all of their existing, you know, sort of work streams. Or in fact, what we see is many of these business processes that you just described actually being re-architected around our data. Mm -hmm. We become the primary function for backroom pools or uh, a key input in computer-assisted ordering, you know, sort of all of those pieces uh, the same is true with the external players. You, you kind of see this, this evolution. Um, what is also important is really the retailer analyzing this data holistically from a corporate business intelligence standpoint. For the first time in their history, they will have the ability to understand um, what the true operational execution of these stores are. And you will be able to understand why stores in the same region with the same labor base, same customer base, you have one that has a 6% out of stock rate and you have one that has a 16. 
you know, why, why is that happening? And you're able to really get to sort of root cause of these questions. And we see operational leadership within these businesses, um, you know, really driving different processes, incentive and accountability around this data. Mm. Awesome. I'd like, I'd like to weigh in on uh, Brad's comments around the store teams that, you know, most of our companies here go in and we run a store evaluation process and we'll interview each one of the store managers below the head store manager. So the meat department, the, the bakery, all the different ones, and really just understand what are, they, what are they charged with? What kind of metrics are they being driven by? What kind of reporting would, would help them, right? So but by developing the robots data to really enhance their, their operational needs is where we all become effective. And I think we all do that pretty well. It's just a matter of refining that. Um, if we just go in and say we're going to scan, you know, all these things, they may have only 50 items they can they can correct per day, right? In the DSD or fast moving aisles, they don't want to report of the 600 items that are out of stock. They're saying, give me the report of these 50 that I can take action on, right? It goes back to that operational item data and. We also have to get to the place where we're filtering data for them. And I think we all do that well as well from the supply chain, understanding if we're integrated into the CAO or the supply chain system and we understand what's on hand, uh, we may see an out of stock, but then the robot and our, our platforms know, wait a minute, they have five on hand somewhere in the store and we're reporting on that. So they then they, they send triggers for their associates to go locate that information. So it all becomes process-based and it's a matter of just understanding those. So. Or, or the reverse of that, BJ, which is I see an out of stock, but I also see our computer system doesn't have any product in the supply chain for whatever reason. Don't waste your time. Maybe like print that. a manufacturer out of stock, but but don't send somebody to go find it when you know you're upstream there's no product in the supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll have discontinued codes. They'll have distribution. Can't get it to them. You know, mm -hmm. different codes in there. So understanding those filtering out to where it works um, is important. Yeah, and, and that talk to the to having the store digitized. Once you have that information digitized, now you can do the the kind of things that you guys mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I think the uh, the incremental approach as everyone's talking about is is just so vital, right? Taking a retailer on a journey toward the destination that we're all describing. You know, for us, you know, even getting someone started with a floor cleaning robot, right? Where you know there really is no inventory data coming out of the machine, but the, the stores are getting used to having a robot driving around, right? So it's it's really taking a retailer on that journey on their time scale um, in order to reach, uh, you know, that really holistic outcome that we're all describing together. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great point, David. And I think each one of you have already said that in a different way. Our robot performs multiple functions of store. It's not just doing shelf scanning and that's all it does. It may do that early in the morning and then it may be dock and then charge up and then like in your case, clean the floor. In BJ's, in your case, navigate for spills. In your case, Brad, do RFID scans. It's doing multiple different tasks, which then leads us into the obvious negative question is, what about people's perception that you're taking jobs away from people? I know you've heard that before. I know you've got an answer for that, but wait a minute, you're taking jobs away from humans. We don't like that. What, how do you handle that perspective? Probably less from the retailer, but more from the customers who are in the stores. You know, it's funny, I'll, I'll, I'll start, and I wonder how, how much everyone will agree with me, but we heard that a lot four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. We do not hear that anymore. Hmm. Um, and so I think people really start to take note of labor shortages and realize that these robots are doing essential functions that really can't be done in other ways. Um, and so for us, just kind of given the macroeconomic environment, given the labor shortages that retailers are experiencing, given the, the tediousness of this task that really can only be handled by a robot, we, we honestly don't get that, that pushback at all. We, yeah, we don't I, see any more. We, we address, I'm sorry, somebody go. No, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I... Uh, we uh, early on back in the day when we brought um, uh, some of the Aho brands on, we had developed a uh, ambassador program. We actually got a third party to assist us uh, in in educating the shopper on why the robot was in there, and that's evolved to educating the associates now. And part of our change management program is to have a FAQ for the associates, just basic things of answering questions that the shopper may ask you know what is that robot doing why is it doing it? and that's helped all of us with the adoption rate and I, I have a funny story where i was 
next to this one gentleman and he's, we're in the chips aisle and he says, what's that robot doing here? And I said, well, what's your favorite chip? And he said, uh, Cheetos. And I said, well, this robot looks at the shelf and as soon as that Cheetos isn't there, it's making an alert back that there's there's no more Cheetos on the shelf. And he, and he said, well, that's great. If that thing's getting me more Cheetos more frequently, then I'm all for it, right? So, um, you know, it's just, again, it's around messaging. And, and to David's point, I don't think the culture anymore, I think um, the industry is mature enough now to, to get used to technology like this in the store. Yeah, I... I I, I agree with all of that. And, and I'd add that because now you have that digital information and you become, now you can actually put a, put a number on what it costs to have an out of stock or do a specific task. And uh, we're working with one retailer uh, um, and, and for every store that they implement with our robots, they add three more headcounts. So we're actually going mm -hmm. in the opposite direction and, uh, and, 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 and that's because you can actually, so if, if before you knew you had to do out of stock, you'd say, okay, I'll put one guy to walk around the store and figure it out. Now you realize that you have, that you have all these holes and, and you can dimension, you, you, can, you can dimension the size of the problem. And now you start to actually do the math and see that three people actually pay for, more than pay for themselves because they're solving these problems that are that are highly measurable. So you went from non-measurable kind of thinking, you know, 10% of my sales are going to be overhead or, or people in the store to now a more scientific approach where 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 you know exactly what every person what every person's throughput is in, in, in light of that. And that is turning out to see to turn into more 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 jobs and less and then uh, just uh, recently uh, uh, in, in, um, in The Economist, uh, an article came out that studies in a lot of different industries have also shown that uh, robots are increasing the, the, the productivity and, the, and, the, and, and people, people being employed than the other way around. So that's, that's uh, getting quickly dis demystified. Well, in all the projects that I've been involved with, when I've been involved with a shelf scanning robot uh, through a couple different suppliers, I've never heard an associate complain because all of the work that it's doing, whether it's cleaning a floor or RFID scanning apparel or literally scanning shelves for outs, those aren't exactly exciting things to do. They're very monotonous. They're very tedious. I haven't seen any of robots here that have arms that can actually stock product. So I don't think anybody's worried at the retail, at the real people who are doing the work are worried about this. I just, I think it's a perception of customers that you're taking jobs away from people, which also brings to one more question and then we're gonna open it up for any other questions we have because we're just about out of time. There's a customer perspective that their robots are getting in the way of me trying to shop. You got all these online pickers in the row and you've got these carts in the way and you got the displays in the pay and I got to navigate a robot. Have you had any perspective from shoppers or customers that robots are an unnecessary thing and they're getting in the way of people literally going shopping at the store? Yeah. So as we said before, uh, we, we try to look at when there's less people in the, in the, in the, in the store, these robots are autonomous self navigating. So when there is a customer shopping, at least our robot does not bother them, and and, and just, it just it just takes longer to scan. So uh, if you do do it in peak hours, it'll just take you know two to three times more to scan the whole thing, uh, right. as as opposed to when it's downtime. So our recommendation typically, uh, I think it was Badger you were that uh, uh, BJ was saying that that it's preferable to do it early early hours of the morning, late in the in the, when the, when the customer counts are low. low. Okay. Great. Folks, we got a couple minutes left. I'm just going to let you guys do any kind of closing comments that you want. Uh, we'll start, David, with you. You want to, any closing comments for the audience? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for hosting us. You know, we're extremely excited about uh, the journey that we're going on with retailers, you know, starting with automating um, something as basic as floor care and then moving up the stack um, into, you know, doing shelf analytics, RFID, all that we talked about today, um, you know, creating uh, delivery robots, um, that allow shelf stockers to be more efficient. Um, and so, you know, our strategy really is about what we call automate the aisle um, and taking retailers on that incremental journey. We heard from everyone here today. These are complex sales cycles. Um, it is a journey that we take retailers on together. We want to meet our retail partners where they are and work with them incrementally 
to automate their operations over time. And we're just delighted to be part of this industry. And thank you very much. Awesome. BJ? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I echo their comments of uh, allowing us to be on this and sharing time with my colleagues. Um, I just want to bring up one thing really quick that we talked about. We were very customer centric here, but uh, um, Brad touched on a thing around dealing with the suppliers and the FMCGs. I mean, this is becoming a very bi-directional information sharing so much that it's going beyond servicing the retailers. We're involved in a lot of pick and pack operations now on the on the side of that because with the e-curve and e-click orders now becoming you know 60 to 70 percent of their revenue, uh, all of these autonomous robots are playing an important role. I know that Badger does in enhancing their e-click operations because I don't know if you guys my my wife orders groceries at home all the time and. She goes, okay, this looks nothing like a ribeye steak, right? Because they didn't know what they were looking for. So, um, but just for the general aisles, I think that uh, we're enhancing overall operations, not only customer service, but just also their online procurement and e-commerce operations as well. So, Yeah, the robot knew your cholesterol levels, BJ. So it chose a, stir a sirloin steak, which was a little bit leaner cut of meat. And uh, so that's really creepy, but we won't go down that path that they actually know what your health records are like. Uh, Brad, any closing comments? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. You know, first and foremost, thanks for bringing together such a wonderful industry group. You know, not only the panelists, but uh, all the attendees here and, you know, creating this conversation. You know, to echo David's comments, you know, we couldn't be more excited about kind of where this industry, you know, sort of is today. As a company, we've grown, you know, more than 10x since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I think this is still the precipice. You know, we're really at the beginning. Um, and what I would encourage, you know, those retailers or retail stakeholders on the phone to really think about is, you know, this is really the only solution that gives you an objective source of truth of what's actually happening on the store shelves. Um, and what most retailers we've engaged with, it, you know, often comes to such a surprise to them if they don't have prior familiarity with the technology is how rapidly it can be deployed and the extreme strength of the overall business case and uh, how strong the pillars are either on sales or margin contribution, um, labor efficiency effectiveness, um, as well as sort of pricing and promotion and, and sort of the downstream sort of profit opportunities that, that we sort of talked about. So, um, you know, definitely encourage continued dialogue sort of across the industry um, uh, and look forward to, you know, future conversations uh, with all of those involved here today. Awesome. And last but not least, Lewis. Yeah. So, so again, uh, I echo the thanks for putting us together here and uh, helping us uh, generate awareness, which uh, I think is is much needed. Um, I again, I echo the 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 fact that digit if if retailers want to move into the digital realm they need to have this part of their business digitized because it enables them to use compute power to be able to do a whole bunch of stuff as you know the the out of stocks as we mentioned the e-commerce as bj was saying uh and then there's a whole bunch of other things that you can do so um you know highly encourage uh retailers and industry to you know take a look at this and uh and 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 see if uh and, and you know give it a try i think it's uh it's at, once you understand it, it's really a no brainer. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, all four of you, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you got lots of things that you've got going on, but thank you for doing such a great job of of representing the the shelf scanning robot industry. Uh, we we will be taking this and, and getting this out onto uh, the platform for conversations on retail and the supply chain organization at Walmart. You can see that via LinkedIn. We'll have the recording of this. Uh, so if you have any colleagues who you really want to have see this but were unavailable, we'll have that available. Uh, last but not least, just a quick quick update. Uh, we, we've got several that we've already done. We've actually done one on algorithms, and we just completed this one, obviously, on uh, shelf scanning robots. On September 16th, we will have one on store audits, whether it's field agent or tracks, et cetera. That is another data collection mechanism, so uh, put that in your calendar for future events. So thank you all very, very much. Happy Friday to you, and uh, thanks for uh, participating. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.